Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again, and everyone pretty much knew this was going to happen on this show. Honestly, I'm just surprised the Mega Power Rangers storyline Shattered Grid did not get picked first. Maybe they expected that to show up on Event Comics Month voting? Spoilers, it will not. Aside from Event Comics Month being focused on DC and Marvel, Shattered Grid is not really an event comic. It's a crossover storyline between Boom Studios' two Power Rangers books that happen to feature pretty much every TV Ranger team up to that point. You want it reviewed, you gotta patron it. Anyway, I don't have much to say about the making of this. As far as I can tell, DC got the ball rolling on it, contacting Boom Studios to see if they'd be interested in doing the crossover, and they were all, hell yeah. The writer, Tom Taylor, has experience writing both this version of the Mighty Morphin team and the Boom Studios continuity, and more notably, the critically acclaimed Injustice Gods Among Us series for DC. The Boom Studios version of Power Rangers basically takes the same premise of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but done with a modern setting and dialogue, still having some of the cheese factor of how goofy the show was, but having a more realistic style to it. For instance, the team being a little hesitant to trust Tommy when he joined their ranks, since he had just finished being evil and all, and they didn't really know him that well. Or Bulk and Skull being their amazingly wonderful selves, but now they're doing, like, YouTube vlogs and stuff too. And let's face it, a Bulk and Skull YouTube channel would be the most brilliant series ever, but they'd probably edit out every time they face planted into mud or whatever to make themselves look better. It's kind of funny, but it seems like 2020 on Atop the Fourth Wall is Year of the Crossover, because we have a ton of weird crossovers going on throughout the year, starting off with Batman Aliens, Revolution, Superman and Muhammad Ali, and now this one. Event Comics Month 3 is coming up later in the year, and there's another one that'll be coming up in two weeks. It's completely unintentional, but some of these are fairly recent comics, so it really feels like people these days want more and more crossovers between material. Still nobody requesting the Alien. Alien Nation and Planet of the Apes one, though. In the meantime, let's dig into Justice League slash Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and see how it turned out. Reading from a trade, and this is six issues, so no looking at the covers. But damn, are there some good ones in there. Anyway, we open over Angel Grove, home of the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, as the caption reminds us. Home to their families, whom we only saw that one time, and they all dressed color-coded just like them, so it's not like the teens did it themselves. Over 376,000 people live in Angel Grove, and yet we only ever see, like, 50 of them at most. Or... they did. I mean, why do you think there's an entire abandoned buildings district? Or rather, we see that there's now a huge crater where Angel Grove used to be. Angel Grove is gone. You see? You see what happens when you have any other businesses aside from a juice bar? The rangers are nearby in their civilian forms, of course utterly horrified by the sight, though the artwork on Tommy is a bit wonky. He's standing up straight and stiff, even just the position of his hand seems to make him look like a robot, which also happened once. Zack has collapsed to his knees and says this is his fault, but someone tells him it isn't. Superman. It's not your fault, son. Trust me on this, an entire city was destroyed when I was brought back from the dead, and the last thing you want is to have a yellow fear entity try to possess you. We cut to 36 hours ago, where Zack is arriving late to a meeting at the command center because he was busy having an argument with his parents about how he disappears all the time. Zordon explains what's up. Alpha 5 is missing. He was supposed to hit the child kidnapping button so he could start putting up the Christmas decorations, but he hit the wrong one. 
Actually, he was out checking perimeter defenses, and Zordon lost his signal. The teens split up to look, though Zack is the one who finds him, heavily damaged and just saying, ay 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 over and over. He brings him to the command center, but before they can summon the others back, Alpha starts melting, and, well explodes. Zack survives despite being so close, but it blows a hole in the wall, revealing Lord Zed and his putties. Yeah, I should note that while this is following the Boom Studios version of the characters, the timeline for both teams is unique to this story. In the books at the time, Rita was still the villain, and when Lord Zed first appeared in the show, the Rangers stopped using their old Zords in favor of the more powerful Thunder Zords. But in the comic, they'll be using the originals. Anyway, yeah, Zed Zed has breached the defenses and threatens Zordon, but Zack steps up. Really? You were just in the middle of an explosion? Have the basic sense to lie down and writhe in pain! Zed, you poor fool! That only happens if the explosion occurs behind them after clearly missing them and then repeated in slow motion! Callish explosions are the only thing that can cause serious harm! You know, I may have watched too much Power Rangers by this point. He morphs, but Zed's putties soon overwhelm him. Zack, however, has already come up with a strategy as he grabs onto Zed's arm and activates the teleportation system. He and some of the putties are beamed away, but unfortunately the teleporters are damaged and they end up somewhere else. Zack and Zed are separated, with Zack landing somewhere while the rest of the rangers arrive and deal with the remaining putties. The Alpha 5 that exploded is explained away as a replica, so he's still missing and that Zack is no longer on Earth. Zack recovers and deals with the putties that landed with him, only to be confronted by Batman. Put down the axe! Now! Blunt axes are not allowed in my city! Only sharp projectiles shaped like bats! Zack, as Batman comments, seems disoriented and may have a concussion. Which is why Zack thinks Batman is one of Zed's monsters and goes on the attack. Still, superpowers are not, it's friggin' Batman, and therefore he's able to restrain Zack, at least until the rest of the Rangers teleport in. They force him back, and Batman calls for backup. They get a better look at Batman, as Billy says this probably isn't one of Zed's monsters, that they've teleported to another dimension. But he's then interrupted, as all of their weapons are taken out of their hands by the Flash. Batman leaps into the Batmobile and shoots a rocket at the group. Zack wants to stay, blaming himself for bringing the fake Alpha into the command center, and the fact that Zed is still in this dimension. Still, Kimberly says they have to deal with the immediate threat, mainly by summoning the Pterodactyl Zord and grabbing the Batmobile with it. You know, everyone was wondering last week when that pterodactyl from the cover of Batman Odyssey is going to show up, and, well, here you go. Kim flies around and narrowly avoids hitting Superman in the Zord. He knocks on it. Miss, I'm going to have to ask you to land your pterodactyl. Superman! Air traffic control! The Jon Stewart Green Lantern shows up and asks Flash what they're dealing with. Flash thinks they're innocent of wrongdoing, that overhearing their conversation, they're just as confused about what's going on as the League. He tries to create a force field around them to keep them contained, but the others summon their own Zords to break free. In a shocking display of concern for a city during a Zord battle, Jason orders Trini and Billy to put their Zords between the fight and the nearby buildings to protect the civilians. The rest fire on John, who's knocked down. Cyborg, who of course is operating by New 52 Origins, is also a member of the League and teleports in to assist. The battle continues for a couple more pages until Superman and Kim call off their respective teams. They both know what's up thanks to Wonder Woman using the lasso of truth on her. I've just had a pretty intense conversation, and I'm thinking I may want my own miniseries, and that's the real reason I'm gonna be leaving the team next season? Wow, this lasso really works. The two groups exchange information, including that they can't leave until they find and bring back Lord Zed. Speaking of, we see him floating around in space until an energy beam picks him up and drops him into some kind of alien city. He demands answers from the locals, but they're more worried about attracting the attention of a giant. Run! Hide! I am Lord Zed! I will not run! I will not hide! Yeah, the Machine Empire says hi, Zed. Anyway, he uses his little grenade thing that he normally uses to grow his monsters on himself. Growing... regular size. Yeah, as it turns out, he was actually taken by Brainiac, who shrunk him down, and apparently decided to just stick him into one of the random bottle cities he has. Because Brainiac gets bored sometimes, I guess. Sometime later, the two are discussing things. It seems we are not dissimilar, Brainiac. We both want the universe. 
I want to rule. You want to put little bits of it in bottles and destroy the rest. To each their own. Please don't tap on the glass. The civilization hates that. Yeah, well, they probably also don't like getting shrunken down and shoved into a jar either. Kinda like to be worried about what they don't like, dude. Zed proposes an alliance, suggesting that maybe Brainiac would be interested in taking a city from his universe. All that he needs is some of the creatures from one of his bottle cities. Back with the League and the Rangers, they continue to hash things out. Yeah, diplomacy would have been a lot harder if we'd squished one of you with our zords. The last robot dinosaur that attacked me is now mounted as a trophy in my cave. Right in between the Bat Baby Memorial and the conspiracy pegboard linking rock and roll music to almost every evil in history. Giant alien octopuses start appearing throughout the world, attacking every major city. Superman calls in all the League members and reserves to help fight the invasion, the Rangers of course volunteering to help. Jason suggests splitting up the Rangers to fight them too, teleport the Zords to several locations to fight alongside them. The Justice League teleporters are implemented too to try to start sending in other superheroes, but then a computer virus infiltrates the Justice League's own teleporters. They're confused how Zed could be doing that, since he knows nothing about computers. However, there's no time to worry about that, since now the Zords are the fastest way for the League members in Gotham to get to the attacks. If you want to join me, there's no time to argue. Batman, get in the Mastodon! That's so dumb! Who shapes their vehicle around an animal? Anyway, we're just at the Batmobile down. Soon, the heroes are engaging the creatures in battle, though Zack notes that this is still weird. Zed's whole deal is making monsters by corrupting things that already exist. Is your Earth different from ours? Populated by actual nightmares? No! All we have are otherworldly gods trying to make all living beings submit to their will, the embodiment of death forcing the undead to rip the hearts out of the living, and one face! Kimberly's advice for taking down the monsters is to just keep hitting them, since they can only take so much punishment before they disappear. Cyborg, coordinating their efforts, detects several small objects dropping out of the sky. One of which hits the Tyrannosaurus Zord, Brainiac drones. The other Zords are equally hit, the drones managing to disable them, as well as steal the Rangers' as communicators and morphers. The Zords, in turn, are taken control of by Brainiac. The demorphed Rangers are rescued by the League, Though Zack doesn't want to leave his Zord, since Brainiac said to him that he was taking them back to their universe. And indeed, the creatures disintegrate and the Zords teleport away. Later, at the Justice League Watchtower, the teens lament their current situation, Superman offering words of encouragement. You're not responsible for the mayhem he causes with the power he holds. All you can, all any of you can do, is work to stop him. I mean, you guys are from over there, and since over there needs to take care of its own problems, we'll be happy to get you back to deal with it. They discuss how they'll need a way to travel back to their own universe, and Billy has an idea, wondering if the DC Earth has a large Hadron Collider. And indeed, they head to Switzerland and the CERN facility. The teens are a bit confused that they can just ask the scientists in the facility to borrow the thing, but as a reminder, Superman, who in this panel apparently forgot his stupid little S-shield symbol on his knot belt, and the end result is that it kind of looks like the two other halves of it are pointing at his crotch. He also kind of looks like he has a five o'clock shadow. Weird. Anyway, the scientists are happy to help, though they're a little skeptical that Billy is the one who came up with their idea. He looks about 12. He's one of the greatest scientific minds of another world. He's not wrong, Billy once built a flying car in his garage just for funsies. Zack, meanwhile, is worried about his family and how their last conversation was an argument. Zack, it won't be the last thing. I promise you'll have many more chances to argue with your parents about absolutely nothing. Just wait until you tell them you're going to a peace conference and never returning. Billy, Cyborg, and the scientists figure out how they can punch a hole into their universe, but they need a way to anchor it to said universe. Otherwise, it could lead anywhere. It can't just be an article of clothing or something. It needs to be something that's still linked to their universe. Fortunately, they do have something. Tommy's Dragon Dagger. It's still connected to the Dragon Zord. The only other problem is they don't want to risk creating a rift in the facility itself. If something goes wrong, they could accidentally destroy the Earth. The scientists don't know what else they can do. The collider is hundreds of feet underground and 17 miles long. I understand, and we'll be very careful with it. Green Lantern, can you hold it together while Superman and I lift? Superhero Comics!
And thus, yeah, they bring the whole facility up into space and activate it, flying the League Javelin through a portal back into the Power Rangers' universe. They find that Angel Grove is in the process of being taken by Brainiac and Shrunken, already surrounded by a dome. The League says they have to let this process play out, or else the forces involved could tear it apart. Zack runs back towards it, and what a coinkydink! He's nearby where his parents are! They can't hear each other, but they understand one another well enough. His parents just happy he's not inside the dome, while he declares that he'll save them. And that brings us to the beginning of the comic, with the city gone, shrunken, and a crater left in its place. Unfortunately, that also includes the command center. While it's out in the desert, I've got to imagine Zed was smart enough to get it taken too. They know Brainiac's ship is in orbit, so they just need a strike team to go up there and retrieve Angel Grove, and another team to defend the Earth, since Brainiac tends to destroy a planet after taking a city. The Rangers want to help. Are you kidding? You're powerless, you- They're not powerless. I mean, I let my own ten-year-old son swing around and fight crime. Give these kids some batarangs and they're fine. Batman stocked the Javelin up with weapons from the League's trophy room. The Sword of Azrael, the Atomic Axe, Green Arrow's Trick Arrows, Lex Luthor's Power Suit, Prometheus' Helmet, presumably one without any useful bits in it. Maybe this is the one that should have gone on Prometheus' head and cry for justice instead of his real one. All that. They also put on masks to hide their identities so that when this is all over, their anonymity with the public is secured. A fan suggested this was... a bit iffy. Not them using the weapons or the like, but rather the method by which this stuff was chosen for them. Sure, Zack carrying an axe is fine, Jason a sword, but specifically Trini as Katana, who uses, well, a katana, not daggers, as if a nod and a wink back to the racism accusations about an Asian woman being the Yellow Ranger, and giving her the identity of the most prominent female Asian character associated with the League. I see what they're saying. There's no particular reason why katana stuff was used, when I'm sure they could have just dug out someone else's stuff for daggers instead of another Asian character's look and motif, but I don't think it's as bad as suggested. Seems more like, here are recognizable Justice League heroes and villains stuff you can use. And they just went with, here, female character stuff and female character's weapons. That being said, Jason is wearing Red Hood's helmet and he's not a League villain, but whatever. Oh, and Kimberly is awesome when she's checking out the boxing glove arrow. I get it. It's for when you want to punch someone who's a long way away. It makes perfect sense. Would have made some seasons a lot more entertaining, I can tell you that. Anyway, the strike team gets on board Brainiac's ship, Cyborg locating the Rangers' morphers and power coins. Superman retrieves them, but just as Zack is about to morph, Cyborg is taken over by Brainiac and shoots him. The problem with making Zack the main focus of this miniseries is that he's also the comic's punching bag. With no other choice to stop him, Billy impales Cyborg on his power lance. Managed to punch a hole into another universe, but can't think of any other way to stop a friend and ally other than stab him in the stomach. At NATO headquarters, where the disappearance of Angel Grove is being discussed, Wonder Woman and three of the Rangers show up to explain what's going on and to rally the people of Earth to fight the approach of Zed and Brainiac. And indeed, Flash soon locates Zed creating monsters to begin their larger assault, while Green Lantern engages Brainiac drones in orbit. Back on board Brainiac's ship, the heroes reunite, and we see that apparently Billy took the time to not only stick Trident's trident in Cyborg along with the Power Lance, but even move the spot where he stabbed him from his stomach to his chest. Great continuity! Brainiac's still functional though, but fortunately with Superman and Batman there, he's restrained and his system's rebooted to purge Brainiac. There's a hole in me? Yeah, sorry, I stabbed you. I aimed for where I figured your non-essential human bits were though. It's a good thing that humans don't have any essential parts in their chest. They locate Angel Grove and elect to come back for the other cities later. However, while he was connected to Brainiac, Cyborg detected that there was someone else aboard the ship with them. Alpha 5. Speaking of, Brainiac is talking to him. I've not had the chance to interact with another binary creature who has achieved sentience. I mean, I tried interacting with Facebook that one time it gained consciousness, but that was a conversation I don't want to repeat. Brainiac wants to know why Alpha works with humans, and he of course does it because they're good people doing good things. That thinking seems flawed. Simple. There's nothing wrong with being able to feel empathy, Brainiac. Only machines can't feel. So my Roomba was lying to me when it said it loved me? You said you destroy planets and put cities in bottles? I consume their knowledge. It becomes mine alone. I learn. And then what? 
Because that all sounds a bit selfish. And thinking only of yourself isn't sentience. Alpha 5 dropping philosophical bombs is not what I was expecting out of a crossover between Power Rangers and the Justice League. He continues on as the heroes on the ground engage the Brainiac drones, talking about how it's about standing with others and thinking of something beyond yourself. As Superman heads out to rescue him, Alpha even questions the entire Bottling City's philosophy, denying those people a future and only gaining a snapshot of their existence, not getting to see everything they've yet to learn. What if these civilizations haven't invented digital watches or the McRib? You're denying these species everything they could be! Superman shows up, but Brainiac is ready for him with a shard of kryptonite. Fortunately, the rest of the heroes ignored Superman's instructions to leave with Angel Grove and instead come to the rescue, dismembering Brainiac in the process. They take his cut-off arm with them and reunite with the rest of the team on Earth. Billy has a plan to use the arm to defeat Brainiac and utilize his tech to restore Angel Grove, but it'll take time. We can't risk summoning our Zords. Brainiac could still take them over and use them against us. Man, wouldn't it suck if he had already done that and we just forgot that that happened? Zed enters the fray with some monsters, throwing one of his growth grenades at it, but Flash intercepts it and punches out the monster first, much to Zed's confusion. Flash hands the grenade to Alpha and tells him to keep it safe. A Brainiac drone approaches him and demands he hand it over. I don't want your destruction. I plan on keeping you, but I will destroy you if you frustrate me further. I get that you don't have any friends, which is probably why you want to keep me, but you've threatened my friends, you've threatened their home, and you've taken their families. I'm not really gonna stand for that. And thus, Alpha uses the grenade on himself. Growing giant-sized. Now all the children of the world will have a magical Christmas! He also punches a giant sandworm. Who shall we have one sign the likes of which even God has never seen? Aye, yay, yay! Alpha, this is amazing and all, but we are not adopting that as the battle cry. Given how dangerous it is, they elect to move Angel Grove away from the area, but then the rangers realize that the command center isn't inside the bottle. And indeed, we spot where it is, in a tiny vial around Zed's neck. And it seems Zed didn't forget about the Zords that had been taken over, since he prepares to use them to attack. However, after examining Brainiac's arm, the team is ready. Cyborg allows himself to be taken over by Brainiac again. See, we studied you. Well, we studied your arm. We only scratched the surface, but we learned enough and we have a surprise for you. You cannot surprise me. I can see every eventuality. I'm a 12th level intelligence. I don't know what a 12th level intelligence is, and I kind of suspect you made it up. The true sign of sentience is having a BS detector. They put a Trojan virus into Cyborg's systems that quickly begin spreading throughout Brainiac and deleting him, disabling all of his drones. With the Zords restored to normal, the Rangers head into them. Zed, being the sore loser that he is, uses his growth grenades on himself. The League attacks, but Zed's staff is magic-based, so he easily takes down Superman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern. Fortunately, the Rangers arrive in the Megazord. They take the command center from his neck and hand it to Alpha to keep safe. Zed hits back, but doesn't do any damage to them. It takes some adjustment, doesn't it? Suddenly having limbs that weigh more than buildings. Maybe if you had some time to get used to it, this would be a fair fight. But you don't have time, and you're not ready for us! Does that mean that all the monsters and Power Rangers who grew giant-sized had a better understanding than Zed when it came to adjusting to the size change? And so, with an I am a man punch and a few more hits to his head, Zed shrinks back down and retreats, only for Kimberly to exit her Zord and hit him with the boxing glove arrow. You know, in the actual show, they only ever engaged Zed in hand-to-hand -hand combat once, and only Tommy. It's fun knowing that if he was wearing boxing gloves, he could have won. Using Brainiac's captured ship, they restore Angel Grove to normal. In the epilogue, who should show up but the real heroes of any franchise, Bulk and Skull, who get scared off by a glare from Bruce Wayne. There's an amusing bit where he offers to pay for their drinks at the juice bar, but he can't because the hundred dollar bill he was going to use has Lex Luthor on it. I'd say it's odd that they let him have his face on it given his presidency ended with him fighting Superman in a suit of power armor. But then again, they still have Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill, so what do I know? And so our comic ends with the two teams saying their farewells, Zordon using his own power to send the League back to the DCU, Billy even giving Cyborg a communicator to contact them should they need help. 
and the Rangers will probably be using it themselves, because we sequel bait with Alpha showing that he's been infected with Brainiac. This comic is great, even if we never get that follow-up. The artwork is very enjoyable and clean, putting a very colorful and bright look to both teams, and showing that they can totally interact in the same universe without it seeming off. Like, say, how Star Trek and the X-Men looked weird alongside each other. Having the main emotional core focus on Zack is a delight for me, because he was always my favorite of the originals, plus it's just cool to have someone other than Jason or Tommy take that kind of lead. It does feel like it's a bit lacking, because we don't see a final resolution shot of him reuniting with his parents, but it doesn't hurt the story or anything. What does hurt it a little is that the Justice League doesn't have any kind of emotional burden held on them. The closest we get is them being a bit surprised that the group are teenagers, but that's just one panel and it's quickly discarded, treating them as equals for the rest of the story. And that's good. The teams should be on equal footing for a team-up, it's just the Rangers get the drama of losing their city and potentially their entire world, but for the Justice League, this is just another day in the park. It also felt like they were setting up for something with how Batman knows how to reboot Cyborg and everyone's a little concerned about that, but that also goes nowhere. Just another example of Batman can be a real dick sometimes. But all in all, the story is solid, with awesome moments like Alpha growing giant-sized and even showing some really good depth the TV show version never got. A reminder of just how well-written the Boom Studio books are. The League members are all great and show off their own unique talents and powers, and the unique situation they have with someone like Superman just asking to borrow the Large Hadron Collider and all. The story is awesome, and I'd love it if this team did a sequel. Next time, more Patreon-sponsored episodes, but now over to Marvel, because it's time for Spider-Man to make a deal with Satan. Again. And yes, I am wearing a new coat. I promised this thing like a year ago, and I finally finished it. I'm not changing the theme song visuals. It's too much work. In my defense, you look scary as hell. And in our world, good guys generally don't dress like bats. Also, good guys smile. Why don't you smile? We're from the New 52, kid. Smiling is for people who aren't cool. You know, like, like us. I'm Batman. Hello, my friends. Please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon. 